Gaude te, gaude te, Christus est natus, ex Maria Virgine gaude te. Welcome to the Rediscovery Channel. This is the channel where I, Ivor Kovac, and my good friends, Stilgar and Great Pharaoh, take turns coming up with topics from history that the other person uh, doesn't know about and often has not heard about. Today, it is my turn, and I'm going, today I'm only joined by Great Pharaoh. Stilgar was not able to come. But I'm going to begin by asking Great Pharaoh, have you heard of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. I have heard of him. <laughs> yeah, yes. you might. It, okay, <laughs> well, <laughs> this. Okay, what do you know about him? Well, the first one I think about is the one from the movie Gladiator. So I don't know if you've seen that movie, but like when he, you know, when he's about to like pass away and get old, he basically wants. Um, I forget his name. The the other guy, like the main character, Russell Crowe, whatever like to become the king in his place. And um, and so I think like his son ends up like assassinating him or something like that. He gets jealous and then tries to like take his spot. So I heard he was like one of the greatest emperors in Roman, during Roman history, you know, in general, during the history of the Roman Empire. Yes, Roman that okay. guy was uh, considered one of the greatest emperors. He was also a stoic philosopher. However, um, this is somebody else. This is this guy is quite different from that guy. So okay. if I say uh, Caracalla, does that? So this Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, his uh, his nickname was actually Caracalla, and okay. so throughout most of this video, I'm going to refer to him by that. But he actually came uh, well after the Marcus Aurelius that you're thinking of, mm. and <clears throat> he was part of a different dynasty. Uh -huh. um, but his, so, so yeah, um, let's, let's get into it. So, uh, Caracalla, which I'm going to call him for the sake of expediency, uh, he lived from 188 AD to 217 and he was emperor from 211 to 217. So it was a very short reign and his parents were the emperor Septimius Severus and Julia Domna. And he had a brother named Gita. Now, my last topic, which uh, you weren't here for, I talked about Septimius Severus. And Septimius Severus was the founder of this uh, very short-lived dynasty. And he actually came from uh, North Africa, and he was of Punic origins, which is a Phoenician colonist who colonized um, you know, the, the area around the northern Mediterranean, including Carthage. And they were actually one of the ancient enemies of Rome. Um, mm. But his father managed to become emperor by way of uh, the military. So, um, as I said, uh, Caracalla, his original name was actually Julius Septimius Bassianus. Okay. And he was named in honor of his maternal grandfather, his mother's father, whose name was Julius Bassianus. And that guy was a priest of the Syrian sun god El Gabal, which was also uh, one of the Baals or Baals, you know, that are mentioned in the Bible in the Old Testament that the Israelites sure. kept worshiping. So um, Caracalla was a nickname that was given to this guy later on by his troops. Um, and again, I'll, I'll come back to like how that gets started. So mm -hmm. uh, his father, Septimius Severus, ruled from 193 AD to 211. And his, while his father was the emperor, he promoted Caracalla to the rank of Caesar, which um, when I was a kid, I used to think it was somebody's name. I used to think Julius Caesar and Caesar salad and, and all that kind of stuff. But actually Caesar is uh, a title, which is given to the heir to the throne. So, his father promotes him to Caesar in 195 AD, which brings him into conflict with um, a guy named Clodius Albinus, mm -hmm. who was a political rival of his father. And what, what uh, his father did was grant Clodius Albinus the title of Caesar in order to kind of placate him. Like he said, sure, you're going to be my heir. And then he turned around and made his son the heir, basically. So 
you know, Clodius mm. knows that his days are numbered after that. Um, and Clodius is defeated in 197. And after that, Septimius makes Caracalla his co-emperor and uh, receives, the, at that point, he receives the title of Augustus. Or rather, he, sorry, he receives the title of Augustus in 198 AD. Um, and so there's a rivalry that begins between uh, Caracalla and his brother Gita. And Gita is the younger brother. And their mother tries to moderate this conflict between them. Um, in the year 202, at the age of 14, Caracalla is forced to marry somebody named Fulvia Pla Plautilla, who is the daughter of the current Praetorian prefect. And that guy's name was Gaius Plautianus. And um, I think you weren't here for the where I talked about the Praetorian guards, but basically they were a special unit of elite soldiers that was supposed to protect the emperor, but they actually killed many emperors and, you know, uh, they could right. be bought. They were, on the they, yeah, they're very open to corruption. Um, and in, in this case, the Praetorian prefect, who is the guy in charge of the Praetorians, was influencing Caracalla's father because he wanted to get himself closer to the throne. So he maneuvered things so that Caracalla would have to marry his daughter. Mm. And Caracalla hates this woman and resents the marriage. So during this time, he starts to plot against the Praetorian prefect, but also against his father. Um, and then uh, Plautinus, he is killed in 205 in uh, some kind of conspiracy. Mm. And Caracalla was glad of it. And he immediately took the opportunity to send his wife into exile. And later on, he does have her killed. First, he has her moved out of the way, out of sight. And then later, he has her killed. So mm. also in 205, Caracalla is made consul along with his brother Gita which just makes him uh, hate his brother even more. It exacerbates the rivalry that's going on between them. Um, and then from 205 to 207, Septimius Severus keeps both of his sons together with him in uh, Campania in order to try to make them like each other because he knows that these guys hate each other and their mother also knows. And they're trying to kind of get them to reconcile but it, when they're together, it just makes them hate each other even more. So it, this does not work. And uh, Caracalla, Caracalla and Gita campaign with Septimius Severus in Great Britain. From 208 to 211, uh, Caracalla conducts a lot of the campaigns in Great Britain himself. And this is mostly in the area that corresponds with uh, England and parts of Scotland today, uh, southern regions of Scotland, I guess. Uh, and during this time, his father is sick and dying. And also, while this campaign is going on, Caracalla gets the nickname of Caracalla. And he is actually named after a, um, a hooded cloak, which, mm. is, which comes from, uh, it was a Gallic style, so from Gaul, uh, you know, Celtic uh, culture. So it's kind of like a, I guess, like a, you know, their version of a hoodie almost. Uh, and this is what he likes to wear. And so he, they just start calling him after it. It'd be like if today we had some general and after that was always wearing hoodies and then they start calling him Hoodie as his nickname. So Caracalla hopes that his father will die quickly of his sickness. And according to some accounts, he tries to kill him without success. And there's a story that um, after this failed murder attempt, his father summons him and puts a sword on the table in front of him and dares him to finish what he started, but Caracalla backs down. Um, and then in 209, Septimius Severus also gives Gita the title of Augustus, and his will was to have both of his sons rule as equal co-emperors after he dies. And so Septimius Severus dies in 211, uh, but just before he dies, he tells both of his sons to get along. And the advice he gives them is basically to treat the military well and uh, treat each other well and just don't care about anyone else or hate everyone else. So uh, Caracalla was 23 
and Gita was 22 at the time of their father's death. Uh, at first, Karakala tries to rule by himself and just disregard his brother, just kind of pretends like he's not relevant at all uh, and issues decrees for the whole empire and so on and so forth. Uh, but his mother forces him to share power with his brother. And, uh, you know, I should mention that their mother, Julia Domna, she actually ran a lot of, um, she handled a lot of administrative stuff and kind of helped them rule. She also helped their father rule while he was there. So um, she was actually pretty important and she also got to enjoy some of the power herself as well. Uh, and so on the way back to mainland Europe after this campaign, the brothers will not even sit at the same table with each other while they're on the ship. Uh, and when they get to Rome, they both try to win favor with the Senate and they live in different parts of the palace. Then uh, the next attempt that they make to kind of end the conflict between them or to end the hostility is they plan on splitting the empire with uh, Caracalla ruling the western half of the empire. Uh, oh no, sorry. With uh, Caracalla is going to rule the eastern half of the empire and Gita was going to rule the, the west, but their mother puts a stop to this. She won't allow them to split the empire. Um, and then in 212, Caracalla offers to reconcile with his brother and sets uh, the place of meeting as their mother's apartment at the royal palace. And he, you know, the agreement is that they're going to come unarmed and unguarded. And so Gita shows up unarmed and unguarded. And when he gets in there, um, <clears throat> when he gets in there, Caracalla sends his, his guards and they kill uh, Gita. And Gita tries to run to his mother for protection, but the guards kill, her, kill him while she is holding on to him. So she gets all splattered with his blood. And uh, actually, I heard that they even cut her on the arm by accident, and she didn't know it until later because she was so covered with Gita's blood. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, this guy definitely, uh, he definitely had the will to power. Um, mm. He was, he was going to get power by any means. So after the assassination... Caracalla gives each of the Praetorians a bonus of 2,500 denarii and raises their ration allowance to 50%. I'm not really sure what it was before. Uh, and then, and, and the reason he does this is because uh, he, not all of the Praetorians agreed to this. Like, uh, they, their original plan had been to honor the wishes of Septimius Severus and allow both of them to be emperor, but he here he is using them to kill his brother. So, I mean, they know it's not the wishes of the last emperor. Mm -hmm. So to make sure there's no trouble, he gives them a nice bonus. And it works, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he raises the pay of the regular legionaries from uh, 500 to either 675 or 750 denarii. The records are not clear. And the next thing he does is purge the government of all of Gita's supporters and even senators like he also, that like nobody is safe. So he kills around uh, 20,000 people, including senators, and he kills a Praetorian prefect as well. Um, and then to prevent governors re from rebelling, he allowed no more than two legions to be stationed in any province. So governors, you're not, if you're a provincial governor, you will never have more than two legions under your command. And probably the reason he did this is because that was actually the way his father had climbed to power. Was okay. he, he used multiple, he used a few different legions uh, and marched on Rome with it. And he started mm. as a governor of different regions. So that's, so he's trying to make sure, you know, that uh, nobody is going to do what his father did in order to overthrow him. Mm -hmm. um, so the question is, how does he pay for all this? And uh, what he does is create some financial reforms. And the first thing he does is he debases the currency um, by reducing the amount of silver that's in the coins, mm -hmm. lower percentage of silver. 
and he introduces a new coin called the Antonini Antonina oh my goodness Antoninianus mm -hmm. uh, okay. which is uh, not that much bigger than a regular denarii but uh, it it's counts for like two denarii something like that so mm -hmm. basically he introduces a new coin which is not worth that much but by fiat declaration says it is so governments you know this is something governments have been doing for a while uh you know where they and they want to pay for things so they print more currency or they debase the currency yeah. Just a way of concentrating wealth uh, in the hands of the government and out of the hands of the people, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, um, and also in the year 212, he issues mm -hmm. the Constitutio Antoniniana de Civ Civitate, mm -hmm. which grants granted Roman citizenship to almost every single resident of the empire. Except for slaves. Um, and this, you know, this may seem like something that is a is a nice thing to do, because, of course, you know, there's definite benefits to being a Roman citizen. Like one of those is you cannot be crucified and you can't just be whipped and flogged, you know, like uh, and, and some of that stuff is mentioned in the Bible, like with Paul, you know, like there's that place where they whip him and they flog him and then they lock him up. And yeah. later on, they find out he's a Roman citizen, and they're like, oh, snap, you know, like, oh, please don't tell what we did and everything, because Roman citizens have legal protections, which um, the average subject did not. Um, mm. And that's also mm. why they cut his head off instead of crucifying him like they crucified Peter, because he's a, a Roman citizen They cannot, you know. So um, it may seem like a nice thing that... Caracalla is doing here, but actually the reason he did it was to increase tax revenues because now that uh, now that there's now that these people are citizens, uh, the the government can tax their inheritances when they die. They can scrape off, you know, kind of like what happens in our country today when we die. The government's going to scrape off a chunk of it, you know, so they even tax you sure. on your way out of this life, you know. Um, but I think. I mean, yeah, like they do, right? It's like you want to save up and yeah. pass on nice things to your kids, and the government's like, nope, we're going to take some right off the top. And it, they yeah. use it as a way of also um, people can lose their land, you know, like farmers sure. and stuff, because they, they're like, oh, you want to pass on? Oh, here's your net value. Okay, you're going to scrape off this much, and then maybe your kids have to sell sure. the land and pay. So, you know. They were uh, doing that back then as well. Yep, yep. Well, I think that uh, probably the Roman citizens were not taxed as much as we are today, and their money had actual inherent value. Like, even though Caracalla reduced the percentage of silver, there's still more silver in their money than there is in ours. So, okay. yeah, I mean, it's true, right? Like, our currency has no inherent value at all, except for maybe pennies if you melt down and, and you can use the copper for making wires and stuff. But um, at any rate, Let's continue. So, yeah. uh, so not pure motives on his part. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a mixed blessing, I suppose. Like on the one hand, you don't have to be crucified. On the other hand, you don't get to pass on as much of your wealth. Um, yeah. right. So much of the tax money that he's raking in is going to go straight to the military. But he also is going to build uh, uh, houses and amphitheaters and racetracks. And again, like the reason he's he'll do this is because he wants these things to be when he goes and uh, visits a city, he wants the infrastructure there for him to be able to be entertained and housed comfortably. But once it's built, it's there for a very long time and other people can use it as well. Um, and he also built the baths of Caracalla, of which the ruins are still around today. Of course, it's no longer functioning. It's it's. Uh, you know, but I'll include pictures of that in the slideshow. And I managed to find some pictures of how it looked when it was still in use before it, it fell apart. Um, in the year 213, he campaigned on the Rhine and Danube frontier against the Germanic tribes. And he defeated a confederation of Alemanni tribesmen. Um, however, well, 
while he was there, uh, he shared in the sufferings of his soldiers. So he would march on foot and he ate what they ate. And he also ground his own flour with them. So he put himself kind of at the same level as as the troops, although not completely because he's not going to be up there on the front line. But uh, mm -hmm. this is kind of unprecedented and it makes him very popular with the, the troops. Um, mm -hmm. There are statues of Caracalla. And so he wanted to, he wanted to present himself as like a military man and a tough guy. And mm -hmm. all the statues of him that you can see and the busts, he's got like this scowl or glare on his face. It kind of looks like a Neanderthal. Um, mm -hmm. And the, that this was done on purpose to make him appear tough and intimidating. However, in spite of all this stuff and how he wanted to be perceived, he was actually physically on the smaller side. And he did not have much in the way of physical strength. And supposedly, he was not even strong enough to wear like the standard cuirass that the soldiers wore. That might be why he wore the hoodie instead, because it did just cover his upper body and you know his his head. Mm. Like, uh, like uh, I'm so tough, I don't need the armor. Mm. It's so mm. tough, you can't wear the armor. But anyway, like either way. Um, yeah, that I wouldn't be surprised if that was his story. That uh, I don't need to wear armor. That's for sissies. Yeah. Actually, he couldn't carry it. But um, okay. yeah. Hmm. So. Okay. Yeah, kind of an kind of an unusual personality. Um, mm. And uh, also, I would just uh, I may have like this uh, ethnically and racially. This guy um, was not a native Roman or even a native European. He was half uh, Phoenician, half Syrian. So he's, he's, he was, um, you know, he was sort of a different, a different, I mean, there were a few, there were a few other emperors that were of Middle Eastern and North African extraction, but it's just kind of interesting, you know, that this guy became so popular with the troops and everything. Um, so because he was, okay, so here, uh, while he does defeat some of these German tribes, um, he's not able to have a complete victory over them, and he ends up making a settlement where he just pays them to stop bothering them for a while. And uh, other emperors, when they attempted to do this kind of thing, they would, uh, they would be killed by their troops, like with a mutiny, it would be viewed as treason. But because Caracalla was so popular with them, they let it slide and remained loyal. And in 214, he goes to Macedonia. And at this point, he begins to think of himself as another Alexander the Great. So mm -hmm. he was really inspired by Alexander the Great, like a lot of emperors were. Mm -hmm. But um, this guy takes it to the next level and actually tries to imitate him. So he, and, and perhaps even thought himself to be Alexander the Great reincarnated. Mm -hmm. um, and while he's in Macedonia, he assembled a phalanx of 16,000 men. And of course, you know, the phalanx was something that was used centuries ago. It was never, it was a Greek formation, you know, that Alexander used to conquer the Middle East as, and go as far as India. But it was not something that was, that the Romans used. Uh, it was a, it was not a part of their regular troops. But this guy thought it would be cool to, uh, imitate Alexander the Great as much as he could, including using obsolete gear. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I wanted to, um, I just want to remind our audience to tie into Macedonia and the history of Macedonia when we talked about Constantinople, the fall of Constantinople with the Byzantine Empire, um, you know, when the Turks took over and everything. So Macedonia, just to remind our audience, is one of those countries that a lot of those, you know, Christian Romans that were part of that empire that was built by Constantine, those were sort of the, those were those countries, one of those countries that were, were formulated, so to speak, when, when Constantinople fell and the Byzantine empire, and they just sort of headed farther east, I guess, um, like Macedonia, Serbia, Montenegro, Croatia, those were sort of the, the remnants, I guess, if you will, of the, of the, some of the residents re, re, uh, of the uh, Byzantine empire. Well, I think uh, like Croatia and Serbia, um, 
Albania, a lot of these pe- populations are actually successor populations. They're Slavic tribes that came down and conquered the area and took it away from the Byzantines before the Turks came. Um, but they did adopt um, oh, wow, you know, okay. Orthodox. They did adopt the Orthodox faith, and they the Greeks gave them a system of writing, the Cyrillic writing, and they all they you know. They were culturally influenced by the Byzantines. Like they still, they it changed the way that they dress and the style of architecture. But they never assimilated to the point where they started speaking Greek. Um, and, okay. and of course, like the like Greece itself, uh, it, you can definitely say that they're a remnant because the Greeks were the main people group that was running all that stuff during the Byzantine period. You know, the major ethnicities of the Byzantine Empire, the most important groups was yeah. the Greeks, the Syrians, the Egyptians. And those were like the main guys. And of course, you know, the the culture survives in uh, the, like the Syriac Orthodox and the Coptic Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox uh, churches. And you still mm-hmm. see the, anyway, you already know all this, so. Sure, um, sure. But yeah, it's very ancient style of architecture. Of course, at at this at this point in time, that architectural style has not like at the time that Caracalla was emperor, emperor, that architectural style had not been formulated yet, and Christianity was didn't have like um, the kind of legal protections that it had later on like when constantine came and from then on out so there weren't really any nice churches yet and actually uh one thing that i can say about caracalla that was good is that he tolerated christians and jews like he did not persecute us um but his father did septimius severus uh continued some of the anti-christian persecutions that came later so Mm -hmm. Even though Caracalla was not like they uh, did not have pure motives and uh, he did kill a lot of people, he at least tolerated uh, Christianity, although it would be some time before it would become legalized, you know, and, and then become the official religion of the empire. Like that's that's a bit off uh, in the future. Sure. Um, yeah, but but uh, uh, good. Uh, good point. Great Pharaoh. Yeah, I could definitely go on with you about that. Sure, all that. sure. I, I love the Byzantine style of architecture and the Coptic style, which is similar. It's, it's my, in my view, like my favorite types of uh, architecture and aesthetics. Um, yeah, sure. Me too. Yeah, definitely. Very rich, very, very rich style, uh, wealthy style of art and, uh, and culture and music and music. I mean, there's so much yeah. music that was written during that time and uh just very masterful uh period definitely definitely yeah for sure yeah Yeah. um so at any rate getting back to this guy uh Mm. he did recruit a 16,000 man uh phalanx designed to imitate the uh army of alexander um using obsolete gear which had not been used because he he wanted to he wanted to imitate alexander as much as he could and then um, not only is he going to put together a phalanx just like that, but he also assembles a troop of war elephants to go along with the phalanx. And my sources that I used didn't really have much to say about this. Um, and prior to this, I'd never heard of any Roman emperor ever making use of war elephants. Usually it's their enemies that would do it like the Persians and the uh, Phoenicians. But I think what was happening here is, um, you know, Caracalla's father, he was a Phoenician colonist. And during the uh, the Punic Wars, where Rome was fighting with those people, you know, like Hannibal came with his, uh, with his troops and tried to bring war elephants up into Italy. And mm-hmm. war elephants were a part of their warfare. So my guess is that, you know, this guy... Um, he was reading the history books and probably thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I had war elephants and a phalanx? I bet I would, you know, it's like a, like something I would have fantasized about in middle school, like a middle schooler sitting down to play Age of Empires for the first time, something like that. So, Sure, sure. 
Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of interesting, but I, I think the war elephants is a result of his Phoenician side, you know, and the history there coming into play. Like, why don't we do this? And of course, mm-hmm. you know, the thing is, there's a reason why um, some things were not done, is because like the Romans, they were very pragmatic. They usually just tried to do what's work, what works, and what works the best. And um, you know, there's a reason why they weren't using this stuff. But this guy is kind of doing whatever he wants. So mm-hmm. um, he's going to send back statues of Alexander the Great to Rome, and mm-hmm. then he starts to commission uh, portraits and posters of himself where like half of the poster mm-hmm. is the face of Alexander and the other half is his. Mm-hmm. And he, he starts persecuting Aristotelian philosophers because he thought that Aristotle had something to do with the death of Alexander the Great. And I don't know what his evidence for, for that was. But mm-hmm. um, then from 214, for the winter of 214 to 215, he's going to leave his troops in Nicomedia and move them to Antioch in May of uh, 215. Mm-hmm. And after this, he's going to leave his troops in Antioch for a while and go down to Egypt where he visits Alexandria because mm-hmm. he wants to see the tomb of Alexander the Great, which um, was there at the time. I don't know if it's still there. Uh-huh. And while he's there, something happens that offends him. So he massacres thousands of people in Alexandria with the troops that he does have. And I'm not really sure what it was. My sources did not say that it doesn't seem like it's fully known. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe somebody just looked at him the wrong way or he walked by a crowd and people were laughing. Could be anything. Um, so in spite of this, you know, it, it should be noted that Caracalla was uh, an admirer of Egyptian civilization, as weird as that may seem. Uh, he was a follower of Serapis and pretended to be either the brother or son of that deity. And he adopted the Egyptian practice of associating the ruler with a god. And he was the only Roman emperor to also be depicted as a pharaoh in Egypt. And uh, I'll include a picture of this in the slideshow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of interesting, right? It's like, oh, I'm a big fan of you guys. Here, let me kill a few thousand. But I'm still a fan. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, very, very... Uh... Very uh, narcissistic, I guess you can say. Narci- yeah. ma- ma- uh, ma- uh, maybe like malignant narcissism, like like you just like be really nice at one point, and then the next few, you know, then just shortly after you do something very evil, and then like then like shortly after you do something very nice, and say so yeah, a very uh, yeah, I mean, pretty uh, pretty pretty uh, freaky, pretty twisted a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and you know there was some concern that his personality was erratic, and you know anything might cause him to kind of unpredictably pop off and start killing people. Sure. Um, and so there there is a plot that starts against him. Um, in 2016, he goes back to Antioch, where there are now six legions waiting for him to begin his campaign against Parthia, which was the Persian Empire of the time. And, of course, he wants to conquer Parthia because that's what Alexander the Great did. Um, Parthia is engaged in a civil war during this year. But even so, Caracalla is unable to take Armenia, which is part of their one of their western frontier provinces between them and Rome. Mm-hmm. So instead of uh, uh, struggling there, he starts launching raids into uh, Media. So he, his troops, they cross the Tigris and go into Media and, I guess, start looting and pillaging. Uh, and then he goes back to winter in uh, Edessa. So he wasn't willing to fight during the winter. Um, and then Caracalla is actually murdered on April 8th of 217 AD at Carhe. And the way he's killed is he goes off to take a pee by himself, you know, Mm -hmm. and uh, one of the Imperial bodyguard actually kills him while he's doing that. And this guy that murders him, his name Mm -hmm. was Julius Martialis, Mm -hmm. and he was a member of the emperor's bodyguard. But the mastermind, the one who planned the murder, was the Praetorian prefect, Marcus Opelius Macrinus. And... 
Yeah, so again, he's um, deposed by, he's actually murdered by the Praetorians uh, when you stop and think about it. And the killer, the actual killer, Julius Martialis, is killed Mm -hmm. by the emperor's mounted guards, like almost immediately, probably immediately afterwards they killed him. Um, But I'm not really sure. And then the Praetorian prefect uh, goes on to become the emperor after this. And Caracalla is 29 at the time of his death. And his mother, after Caracalla is dead, his mother tries to kind of hang on to power, um, you know, the power that she's enjoyed. But uh, the new emperor doesn't really accept her or allow it. And Mm -hmm. so she dies a little bit later, either from uh, natural causes or from suicide. It's possible Mm -hmm. that she might have had breast cancer. Um, it's not really it's not really known for certain, but that's pretty much the end of these people um, for a while. So they have uh, the father and the son, and then after that, the Praetorian prefect takes over. So okay. that's yeah, that's all I've got on this one. Uh, okay. Anything you want to add or? I mean, what would you say? Just summarize for for our audience. Um, just the the effect that he had, the the, the significance of, of of his life. You know, just how how would you summarize it overall? I mean, is this, is this a person that you know society obviously has to watch out for? This type of uh, uh, leadership. Uh, is there something anything good that that came out of this man's uh, life? So good, yeah, good question. Um, is there anything good that? <laughs> is there anything good that came out of this man's <laughs> life? I guess uh, the baths of Caracalla and you know some of the some of the structures that he built in the, in the different sure. cities that he visited, you know, sure. race tracks and amphitheaters. Um, <laughs> and he didn't kill the Christians, you know, like if I was alive back then and probably you also, and my main concern for the Roman emperor would be, is this guy going to kill me or put me in some <laughs> Colosseum or light me on fire? And, <laughs> Feed you to the lights or, you Yeah, know. <laughs> you know, and, and like he didn't kill us, which I think, I think um, I would like okay. that, you know, yeah. and he did kill <laughs> a lot of other bureaucrats and politicians and such. And I don't really... Honestly, I I find yeah. it hard to be sad when the government kills itself. You know, like when they're I I think think they're that <laughs> when the government like he's taking is, out his political rivals, but he's like defending the the Christians, so to speak. So it kind of sounds like Putin a little bit. You know, being being a Russian Orthodox uh, country predominantly, and he he takes out all his political rivals. He 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 keeps. You know, he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't persecute the the Christians of the land. He rather he celebrates with them. So it's a, it's kind of you know. But then again, I don't want to get into it too much. Everybody has their own opinion on Putin, but you know, you know, obviously there's something there that that makes the country love this guy. So I'm not trying to think that. even though obviously the rest of the world, um, you know, may see him as as sort of the the counter uh, the counter view, you know. Yeah, oh, and, and yeah. the Russian military actually um, just, I think in 2020 it was, they just uh, partnered with the the Russian Orthodox Church and they built a very nice cathedral and the Russian patriarch came and blessed it and consecrated it and all the, gen- like a lot of the generals were there. You can see it on YouTube. It's a very nice building. And um, the, the thing is, like a lot of people, they don't understand about Russia is that historically the Russian church has always been a partner with the Russian state. So like the the way that Russians converted to Christianity in the first place is they sent, um, during the Kiev Rus period actually, they sent ambassadors to check out Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Islam, and Judaism. And Judaism, they pretty much, like these guys were pagans, they were polytheists, they didn't have any kind of biblical training or anything. But they rejected Judaism right away because the Jews lost their homeland. Like they were not in control of their own homeland. The Muslims were. So they figured the Jewish God has no power. And and then they weren't impressed with Roman Catholicism. And they didn't like Islam because it forbade drinking. 
But the ambassadors that went to Constantinople, they brought back like a very good report. And they said, you know, like while while we were there, we couldn't tell if we were on heaven or in earth. So the Russians chose, mm -hmm. um, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy. And then they eventually they, they got their own patriarch and the patriarch and the Russian emperors, you know, they would be they would they would be partnered. Um, so Russia always had like a, a church state alliance up until the Soviet period when, you know, the communists took over. They tried to stamp out um, all forms of Christianity and they persecuted the Orthodox Church. So, you know, people are like, why is Putin working with the Russian uh, Orthodox Church and why are they working with him? Well, that was how it always was in Russia. But everybody that's alive today was born during the time or later was either born during or since the time of the Soviet Union, where under the Soviet Union, the relationship was uh, the was hostile, like atheism was the official religion of the state. So like we don't have like the historical context, but like Putin, he's getting kind of like trying to or, you know, somewhat going back towards the old Tsarist period where okay. that sort of thing was normal. Um, okay. So that, that's basically what it is. I don't know whether or not like, you know, I, I used to think that uh, Putin was a good guy, but. Um, he signed an executive order allowing for the development of central bank digital currency, which is the most horrifying um, mm. technological development in the history of man. Of course, our government is also working on that a little bit. And, it, and the way they might introduce it would be like kind of like how Caracalla introduced his new de depleted currency. You know, like he made a new coin and said, oh, but it's worth more than your existing coins. Um, and, and one of the things that happened when he did that was people, after a while, they knew that like the, um, the new denarius that were being printed had less silver in them. So they started hoarding the old denarius and mm -hmm. you ended up also having inflation going on. Um, but then the new coin, the Antoninianus, that was supposed to be worth two denarius um, was not twice the size and certainly did not have twice the silver content. So, mm -hmm. so he's trying to, um, you know, make you have less. Like he's he's taken away the, your silver, and yes. and I I wouldn't be surprised if like the way they enter, you know, the way that they bring in a central bank digital currency is they just assign it higher value than our dollar. Mm -hmm. Like like maybe one unit will be worth like maybe one uh, digital dollar will be worth like. Uh, 50 regular paper dollars or something like that and they'll get people to start using it um, and then eventually they'll phase out paper you know I hope not I it, but again like studying history you can see all the things that have been done and you can kind of see um, you know how things are being done again like as the same tricks are being used by governments that that were used in the past it's you know it's Everybody just has to be vigilant. Like you have to study history. If you don't sure. know anything, you can be easily tricked. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So. You just don't know until it, you don't learn until it actually happens. You know. And so. In um, the hard way. You know. So. So definitely get a. <laughs> Want to make all our audience aware about all the different perspectives, all the possible scenarios. You know. You know, like history has seen it. You know, the world has seen it. It's been there, done. The, you know, it's all there. It's just a matter of knowing and being aware. You know. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, and and the the Roman emperors are interesting. You know, and and one of the things that was really interesting to me about uh, not just uh, Caracalla, but mainly about his father. Like his father was again uh, a Phoenician guy. And those people were the historical enemies of Rome. And the Romans conquered them and annexed them. But then later on, uh, not uh, Carasala's father, Caracalla's father, um, Septimius Severus, he did what Hannibal failed to do, that tried to do by force. This guy became the emperor of Rome, Septimius Severus. So you had a Phoenician guy 
ruling over the Roman Empire that was that had conquered his his ancestors, their you know historical enemy. And it, it got me thinking, like you know, you sometimes when you go and uh, sometimes when empires expand, they maybe more than sometimes, but you know, they also sow the seeds of their own demise, their own conquest. And and I was wondering if they had not uh, annexed you know North Africa that uh, set Septimius would not have been emperor. I would say, and Septimius um, wasn't one of the worst emperors. Of course, he persecuted Christians. Um, but yeah, another another thing about Caracalla that was kind of a lasting contribution, and I would say for the worst, is that emperors started ruling by way of the military. Like his father had said, you know, whatever you do, treat the military well and don't worry about everybody else. And that's definitely what this guy did. Like he kind of took it to the next level and then it became a pattern for other emperors that would come later. And of course we, we still see a lot of this today, like, um, you know, with, with dictators in different countries, like you can be the worst, most cruel, despotic, insane dictator in the world. But as long as you're nice to the military and you still pay them and treat them well, then you can still be the worst dictator in the world. It's, it's kind of a, um, a rule, like a, uh, an axiom, you know, like you really, you really just need the military. If, you're, if your only goal is to hold on to power, the military can do it for you. So, yeah, that's why the Kim Jongs have lasted as long as they have, I suppose. And, yeah. Uh, you know, these other kind of dictators. And then, of course, if you offend the military, then your chances of holding on to power get a lot less, especially oh, yeah. if people yeah. already hate you, you know? Like, I think that's a situation in Egypt where Sisi took over because uh, the new guy, uh, Morsi, he... It was Morsi, right? The, it was Morsi, yeah, Morsi, yeah. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't have the support of the military. And I think the population in key areas also did not support him. So, you know, CC was able to just use the military to come in. And since he's come in, um, he's just remained there because he's still got the military with him. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, man. Well. Yeah, so right on. That, that was, that's awesome. And uh, I feel like we definitely, um, you know, get a better idea of, you know, uh, the, these types of leaders that, that we have, um, you know, that we've seen in history and that we've seen today. And, you know, let the people make a decision. I mean, we look at the results and, and you know, every ruler is going to try to, you know, sell himself, right? And, and you know, try to prove himself to the people. There are rulers who just simply don't care, as we've seen in the past. They were just very brutal and they were very you know, very much about themselves, obviously, there's corruption uh, at the very top, but there are rulers who, who did the right thing, and they did, and they did change the world, you know, King Constantine the Great, which is what we talked about, that was our last discussion, or yeah. one recently, you know, where, where he obviously, you know, you see this, this guy who's not perfect, nobody's perfect, and, you know, he had his, he was kind of brutal in the beginning, you know, when he fought Christians and, you know, he's sort of a womanizer too, you can almost argue. But at the end of the day, uh, he, he was considered a saint because he, he, you know, he basically changed the world by, by establishing the first official Christian empire. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's quite amazing. It's quite remarkable, you know, when we, when we look at this and, and we look at the leaders of our countries. Um, we can tell pretty quickly, you know, what kind of leaders they are. You know, they, they really do, um, you know, history really does reveal itself uh, very clearly uh, what a country can ex expect, you know, when they, um, you know, you know, based on what the, they're, they're presenting in the beginning. So very interesting, very fascinating. And, uh, you know, thank you for sharing, um, uh, Ivor Kovac. So, uh, All righty. Well, um, yeah, so then uh, with that, I guess we can close it off. And if anybody has listened all the way to the end, thank you for listening. If you have any questions or comments, do let us know. And I guess uh, I'll see you guys in the, the next one. Yeah.
Thank you guys. Christus es Maria Virgin